<laughs> well, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Charity Kalutak Blanchett. I was born and raised in Alaska. I was born in Anchorage, raised in Wasilla, which is about an hour suburb outside of Anchorage. Anchorage is Alaska's largest city. New Orleans has a population of about a million people. Alaska has a state population of less than a million people. So I, that gives context to where I grew up culturally. Um, our, my hometown's claim to fame, actually, I like to tell this little joke, was Sarah Palin. She was our mayor, which I believe gives cultural context to how uncultured it was in Wasilla, Alaska, where I grew up. Um, Fast forward, moving to New Orleans in 2015, um, I consider New Orleans to be the culinary capital of the United States and living here and spending time in the community has truly transformed my life. And I was also able to see the cross-cultural ties between indigenous Alaska and also um, indigenous down here in Louisiana. Um, my mother, Martha Blanchett, she is a strong, powerful Yupik woman born and raised in a little village called Tuntatuliak, and my father, Reverend David Blanchett as well. Um, I like to say he's a strong black man from Philadelphia who made his way to Alaska after the Vietnam War, fell in love and never left. <laughs> <laughs> so today I'm here to share my culture, the Dipping Spoon Foundation, our food, our feasting, our way of life in the best way that I can in an hour and a half. In a nutshell, I founded a little nonprofit organization doing big things, the Dipping Spoon Foundation. And our mission is identifying and cultivating the next generation of black indigenous women of youth to become culinary rock stars. And we, I believe we do this completely centered in our cultural identity and through all the avenues that food touches, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math, for dessert, public policy sprinkled with equity. And I will go ahead and get into that. Um, right now. So without further ado, I prepared what I call an essay titled The Future of Food. And I believe this will give y'all a headspace into who I am as a woman, as a woman of color, and as a woman who stands firm and proud in my cultural identity, where Dipping Spoon is now and where I see us growing and building, um, not only in the state of Alaska, but also here in New Orleans, but also globally. Indigenous people, black people, we're everywhere. And so my goal is to create an accredited, an accredited indigenized culinary arts curriculum. And I'm very excited to share what I believe is the future of food. What people have forgotten is what every salmon knows. Salmon understand the art of facing things. You can press play if it haven't already. So this is my mother's village in Tuntatuliak. So this will just play in the background for you to see. I'm Charity Kalutak Blanchett. I'm an indigenous Yupik and black woman born in Alaska on Denina land, a descendant of the Yupik tundra from Tuntatuliak, the land of the caribou, with an ancestral bloodline traced back 10,000 years, ultimately time memorial. My mother's village sits on the Kinok River, where marshy tundra weaves its way three miles and meets the currents of the Kuskokrum River, eventually opening to the Bering Sea. My mother's rural Alaska native village is home. My Yupik name is Kalutak, and it means dipping spoon, a name passed down to me, my ancestral blueprint. The meaning of dipping spoon, from one dip, you serve other people. You dip into the water, the water is given to everyone, it grows and keeps going. In 2019, from the balcony of my home here in New Orleans, I founded the Dipping Spoon Foundation. Our mission is identifying and cultivating the next generation of black indigenous women of color to become culinary rock stars by providing aspiring chefs between 18 and 26 with a full ride culinary and pastry arts scholarship and shifting culture by creating access to inclusive and dynamic food STEM programs rooted in cultural identity, food sovereignty, food science, and food math for girls and boys through seventh and 11th grade. We do this by offering monumental access through all the avenues which food touches, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math for a dessert, public policy sprinkled with equity. Not everyone is going to be a head chef at a restaurant or a celebrity chef on television. There are endless educational, employment, and executive level business opportunities through food. Fall, spring 2021, so if, as you take a look at your map, that um, your map, my father created this little pamphlet. And on the inside, you see the state of Alaska. 
And you're going to see different areas outlined with the different tribes. Alaska actually has over 250 tribes in the state. But if you just want to take a look at this, my mother's village, you'll see Tuntatuliak right here. Fall, spring 2021, 2022, Dipping Spoon partnered with the Low Okusokum School District, LKSD, for our inaugural food STEM curriculum and after school club titled Self Esteem for 7th and 11th grade Indigenous youth, which celebrates culture, nature, identity, traditional values, and the earth through food. The Lower Kusokum School District is Alaska's largest rural school district in the number of schools, students, and staff. It is located approximately 400 air miles west of Anchorage. The district encompasses the lower part of the Kuskokrim River Delta along the coast of the Bering Sea. It is Alaska's second largest rural school district in terms of geo geographical area, roughly 22,000 square miles of roadless tundra, and it is an area equivalent to the size of West Virginia. 80% of Alaska is only accessible by boat or plane, including my mother's village. Mm -hmm. Headquartered on the main campus in Bethel, the district office provides coordination and support to 22 village and six Bethel school sites. Our culinary school club piloted at three rural school sites, including my mother's village, Tintatuliak, Good News Bay, and Kipnuk, with the intent to grow district-wide. We utilize Chef Alice Waters' inclusive and dynamic edible schoolyard curriculum. Alaska's unique geography and cultural diversity are what makes us stand out nationwide. Technology, media, and innovation are the forefront of our programming. Together, Dipping Spoon and the Lower Kostokum School District are shifting culture and creating a paradigm shift of change for aspiring indigenous chefs and food lovers to have educational, entrepreneurial access to every industry that food touches. Late spring of 2022, Dipping Spoon held our first week-long culinary arts camp intensive in rural Alaska at Bethel Regional High School for 10 Indigenous students. The culinary camp was a week-long intensive, teaching the fundamentals of cooking as they dove into the four elements that make food taste great. Dipping Spoon student programming was rooted in food STEM, cultural identity, food sovereignty, and traditional values merged with modern day technique. The Edible Schoolyards curriculum introduced basic knife, cooking and cleaning skills with the curriculum slightly tweaked based on the needs of Bethel's rural location. This included creating our own harvest map and seasonal hunting guide. Camp leaders and students, we loosely followed Chef Samin Nasrat's cookbook and Netflix show, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. Each day was themed around all episodes with continuing discussions around taste and flavors while we cooked and communed together. And did we cook together? I have photos I'll share shortly. Self-esteem campers took field trips to the grocery store and visited the only farm in Bethel, Alaska, Meyer Farm, located in the virgin tundra. Our students journaled about their cooking experiences at home and camp, blind tasted food and noted what excited or didn't about a new taste and flavor. They produced their own food photography, food writing, menu development, and working together as a team. They learned when we respect our ingredients in the kitchen and workstation, we in turn are respecting the land, ocean, and sky, which leads to our cultural identity. After a week-long intensive, cooking two meals a day, our campers took on the ambitious task of catering Bethel Regional High School's art showcase, where they debuted their culinary art and menu. Chefs are artists, food is their paint. Chefs are also scientists, mathematicians, poets, and business people. Our students embarked on a massive feat and delivered big time on taste, presentation, flavor, and creativity. Like Salmon, Dipping Spoon students understood the art of facing things, trying new things, and not being afraid to journey to a destination unknown. And then I have a part two. But before I get into part two, when I founded Dipping Spoon, my goal was just, I'm going to create a culinary scholarship to send Indigenous youth to culinary school planned fundraisers here in New Orleans and in Alaska, and then the pandemic hit and everything canceled. And I basically stewed and wallowed in self-pity for a couple months, figuring out what am I gonna do? What's my pivot? And it made me realize that providing a scholarship to indigenous youth to attend culinary school actually didn't fix the root of the problem. It didn't fix the root of access and representation. In fact, I realized it was a Band-Aid fix. 
So I went down a deep dive on how to get students involved from a young age. So I looked at other different nonprofits out there that are centered in STEM. And in the state of Alaska, we have a big push towards steering students towards um, engineering. Well, I believe food is STEM's rock star cousin. And in the state of Alaska, as you see in the video, we still live a subsistence style of living. When I moved to New Orleans, it was the first time ever in my life I ever heard the term farm to table. And I giggled. Farm to table is nothing new. It is a gentrified term for subsistence living. And it got me thinking, well, where are people getting their food if they're calling it farm to table? This is a way of life every single day, not just on a Monday or a Tuesday. In the summertime, we go to fish camp and we harvest for the winter. My culture, my people, we have been doing this since time memorial. And going back to the salt, the fat, the acid, heat, all indigenous cultures, salt preserves food, fat preserves food, acid preserves food, and heat in conjunction with them all preserves food. So I realized, how can I preserve my culture through food and really foster the next generation of indigenous youth to become culinary rock stars? And my fix was to create an after-school club called Self-Esteem, rooted in cultural identity and all the avenues that food touches. I believe when we start students young, centered around their cultural identity, it's going to carry them. I believe in the power of mentorship so deeply. I was a huge student government nerd in high school, and student government definitely helped steer me towards becoming structurally organized with Dipping Spoon. I'm a woman of action. If I see a problem, I'm going to figure out how we can turn it around. And I'm very realistic in the expectation of knowing that change doesn't happen overnight. And also, if change doesn't hurt a little, it's not change. So that's where the self-esteem after school culinary club came into place, was getting to the root of the problem and creating long-term system solutions instead of a Band-Aid fix. This spring, I received an email from an educator in rural Alaska reading, the reason I'm emailing you is to see if the scholarship program for the culinary arts in New Orleans is in place. I have a young Yupik lady who is super passionate about pastries and the culinary arts your program came to mind first. When I first started Dipping Spoon, I actually reached out to NOKI, the New Orleans Culinary and Hospitality Institute, and they graciously were super excited to team up with Dipping Spoon and provide a place for indigenous Alaska Native students to come and go to culinary school, not just culinary arts, but pastry arts. Dipping Spoon's mission had come full circle. We have a first possible applicant, a young Yupik woman, an indigenous student. This has been my dream formed from a mustard seed, turned into a goal, and has the opportunity to be transformed into reality. This is an exciting, life-changing moment for this student. Around the same time, an educator from rural Bering Strait School District, which is located just below the Arctic Circle, reached out to me with the hopes of partnering for a fall 2023 school semester program of self-esteem. The Bering Strait School District is a school district in northwestern Alaska, serving approximately 1,700 students in, K in grades K through 12 in 15 isolated villages. Some of these schools will have 30 students and some will have 400. Some of these schools will have every single student in the same class, and some will have maybe five or six. All schools in the district serve students of all ages and most classrooms are multi-age. The district headquarters are in Unalakleet, Alaska. And that's where I just came from. I spent a week in Alaska last week sharing Dipping Spoons programming with the Bering Strait School District with the intent of creating an accredited indigenized culinary arts curriculum that counts towards graduation for their students. All of these things were amazing accomplishments, especially personally, after completing a nine-month legacy fellowship with the James Beard Foundation and being selected and awarded as a U.S. speaker with the U.S. State Department, where I was a panelist during Alaska Native Heritage Month, highlighting my work as an Indigenous leader, providing perspectives on key issues such as access to education, environmental stewardship, economic opportunity, and mentoring the next generation of Indigenous leaders. All of these things were the highest accolades of my life, of my adult life.
an incredible honor to be recognized for my work and unwavering mission with Dipping Spoon. After the chat, though, I hit a wall. After all the emails from Alaska stating that rural schools wanted more, I had been shell-shocked with news that shook my personal values and my business values. My North Star is fueled by access and representation. I envision a global world where all Indigenous youth champion their culture and, and ancestral blueprint to rebel against institutional boundaries, to become creative, entrepreneurial, culinary rock stars through food, science, media, design, and public policy. This is why I, Kaluta, a Yupik and Black woman born in Alaska on Denina land, a descendant of the Yupik tundra from Tuntituliak, since time memorial, I cannot and will not let any company or entity steal and profit off of my ancestral Yupik identity. A year ago, I discovered a Canadian consumer packaged good company in food egregiously named Yupik, spelled the exact same way as my culture, Y-U-P-I-K. Their mission at Yupik, our goal is to combine years of experience in direct sourcing and manufacturing of high quality products to provide you with ingredients and snacks that cater to your tastes. We carry an extensive organic and conventional variety of products such as nuts, dried fruits, superfood snacks, mixes, candies, chocolate, and cooking products. Our tenacity and ambition continues to make us grow and work harder every single day to offer quality ingredients and snacks that speak for themselves. This Canadian food-based corporate company stole the name of my people bought the domain name upic.com, registered and trademarked Yupik with the intent to sell to their Canadian and global non-Canadian market. A large-scale Canadian consumer packaged good company in food owns Yupik. We are a federally recognized tribe, a name rightfully owned by Yupik people, our bloodline, a name Yupik which translates the real people. This is erasure of culture. Canada and the United States, and Alaska, has a terrible history of racism and violence towards Indigenous children and people, and for them to cross the line so boldly and appropriate <clears throat> Indigenous Yupik people, dismissing us as if our history does not exist or our existence does not matter. How did this happen? Who did their due diligence? A corporate consumer packaged goods in food, no less. This is blatant erasure of culture, overtly and distastefully gross. Do they have any indigenous people working for their company? I advocate for representation and all the avenues that food touches. My work is anchored in it. This company does not advocate nor do they care because if they did, they would never have so grossly named their nut picking company, Yupik. Who was on their executive team? No one in marketing spoke up. Surely they have a board member who might've been curious on branding and future public relations. What government entity and or authority or attorney gave them the authority to cross country lines and purchase a name, people, and culture, which does not belong to them? Purpose is more than a marketing dollar. It's not about what you say, it's about what you do. This company is actively participating in racism, erasure of culture, colonial power, and maybe a mammoth landmark case. And that's where public and private policy comes in. July 20, July 19th, 2022, I tagged Yupik in my stories stating my indigenous Yupik ancestry and how blatantly wrong their company name is and that they should be ashamed. I shared a black and white photograph of my mother as a toddler in Tintituliak with my aunties and grandmother wearing our traditional furs, a photograph depicting the real people. This Canadian company responded to my tag stories with, hello, Charity. Thanks for reaching out. We take your input at heart and hope to answer some of your concerns. Our brand is based on an abbreviation of the English words, you pick, because we offer a large selection of food products that one can pick from. We mean no offense to the Yupik people. We value and actively promote respect, inclusion, and diversity within and outside our organizations. People of all horizons and backgrounds work at Yupik, and we are grateful that they are a part of our family, once more, we appreciate, your, we appreciate your time and remain available at support at upic.com if you wish to share further concerns or suggestions. Respectfully. Respectfully, 
Their response is full of coded language and further showcases their grave disconnect with culture. Indigenous Yupik values are based in sharing, community, and love. This company does not embody any form of value system. In fact, they are promoting deep-seated racism, ugly cultural disrespect, exclusion, and lack of diversity, and common sense to understand that their actions are sickening. This is basically what, white, what fragile white people in America say all the time with their unconscious bias. Well, I have black friends. The future of food is indigenous. The future of food is fueled by cultural representation. The future of food is not allowing foreign corporate organizations to commit what I consider a crime by stealing the name of my people, a United States federally recognized indigenous tribe from the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta for greed, control, and power. What is my ask? This Canadian company must change their name and rebrand immediately, internally and externally. It will be costly and it will not be cheap. They chose that life. They must sign a pledge to invest in programming for the next generation of culinary indigenous rock stars through all the avenues that food touches in Alaska and in Canada. Those are my cousins. They will assist in Dipping Spoon's growth. They must complete an internal audit and in hire indigenous people. They must admit the people who signed off must state their names admit their wrongdoings and explain their plan of action to do better and how they will implement it. Dipping Spoon's mission has come full circle. We have a first possible applicant, a young Yupik woman, an indigenous student. This has been my dream formed from a mustard seed, an exciting, life-changing moment. I can't wait to see what she becomes and how she designs her life through food. If we have one student, it means we have a community of students which is why Dipping Spoon's programming needs to continue in indigenous rural Alaska school districts. It also means as a leader, founder, CEO, and sole decision maker, I must adapt to change, discomfort, and eye-opening truths about the food industry. How can I advocate for cultural and gender representation in all the avenues that food touches and inspire indigenous youth when there is a consumer packaged good company basically telling my students that they don't matter their cultural identity doesn't matter. And they're not just telling us, they're showing us. One of my mottos in life is show me, don't tell me. I am asking you, my community, to join me and support in our mammoth task to save the future of food for indigenous youth. This Canadian company must change their name. I will never give up on access or questioning why systems operate the way they do. Dipping Spoons after school culinary club students and our future scholarship recipients deserve their time to innovate, shine, and thrive. To create and be active participants in the culinary business world and the world they want to live and choose to live. To see themselves, their cultural identity, and all the avenues that food touches, science, technology, mm -hmm. engineering, arts, and math. For dessert, public policy sprinkled with equity. Together, we are creating a paradigm shift of change. This is our strength, and this is our superpower. I believe we champion culture by rebelling against boundaries. We're investing in the next generation of indigenous culinary rock stars, chefs, CEOs, C-suite executives, artists, and political leaders. This is the future of food. Thank you so much. <laughs> As you can see, I'm very passionate about um, my culture and where I come from. And that passion would not have come without my parents um, stewarding. Um, in my house growing up in Wasilla, I always knew every day that I was a strong Yupik woman and that I am a strong black woman. There was never any day when I looked in the mirror and I wanted to be anything but myself. And so I thank my parents for being the hub and the anchor. And I have five brothers. I'm the only girl. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had to fight for space. And um, thank you so much for in that fight for space. It has allowed me to fight for space also in this world as well for my culture and for young little girls, especially, but young men and women in the state of Alaska who look like me. 
one reason why I love New Orleans so much is all my life, all I've ever wanted to live is in a place where when I walk out the front door, everyone looks like me. And when I was a child, my father recorded every single episode of Cosby Show and Different World. And we would watch, my brothers and I would watch um, those shows, Christmas break, summer break, basically all the breaks because my parents were very strict and we weren't allowed to watch anything else. And so we watched these shows over and over and over. And my favorite was Different World. And it was the first time in my life where I saw black individuals that were all different shades of brown. And when I left Alaska, I moved to Hawaii, a place where also when I walk out the front door, I also look like everyone else, considering that Alaska Native people, we do tend to look a little Asian. And my mother, my parents actually retired to Hawaii, and my mom chose Hawaii because when she walks out the front door, everyone looks like her. And I chose New Orleans is because when I walk out the front door, everyone looks like me. Everyone is brown and beautiful, and they're all different shades of brown, which is why I chose to live here. I moved here for love. I fell out of love. I left, healed in Hawaii, and then I moved back. And I wouldn't have moved back to this city if I didn't love it so much. And a part of that love definitely is the community, the people, the culture, the food especially. And then the culture reminds me of my indigenous culture back home. My very first Mardi Gras, I will never forget. It was, I was St. Charles, it was right across the street from Desi Vega. My friend had like a big pavilion thing, I don't, risers, whatever you call them. And the parades came by. And all of a sudden, you know, they're throwing things. And it reminded me back home. When I was a little girl, I became a woman when I was 11. And different cultures have different ceremonial um, practices around when you become a woman. And I was 11 years old. I became a woman. And I had to do a year-long um, honoring of our womanhood. I couldn't, there were certain foods I wasn't allowed to eat. I had to wear different types of string around my wrists, my ankles, and my waist. I had to wear a hat every time I went outside. My parents definitely dictated what I could eat, what I couldn't eat. I, I was actually not allowed to have sugar, refined sugar. The only form of sugar I was allowed to have came from chocolate milk because I needed some form of sweetness. At the very end of the year-long um, honoring of preparing my body for womanhood, we have what we call um, a throwing party, an oqueto. And it's for women only. And I called it my junk food party. And my mother told me that I could invite all of my classmates, my girlfriends, and their mothers. And we would have a big junk food feast. And I remember being really excited because I love, at the, I don't love them anymore, but at the time I loved these suckers that you could get from Walmart that were like apple with caramel on top. <laughs> oh my God, I love them so much. And I could not wait to have that at my junk food party. <laughs> and all my friends arrived with their mothers. And it was the only time, I was 11 years old, so i just become a woman. I was going into sixth grade. I'm going through puberty. And, I, and my mom announced to my friends and the mothers, Charity became a woman a year ago. And so we're celebrating her womanhood. And I remember being so embarrassed. Because I didn't tell any of my classmates the ritual, the year-long ritual that I had to go through. Because I was embarrassed. I didn't know if they would understand. And also, I grew up in a very, very white town. And the reception that I received from my classmates and their mothers was actually, oh my god, that is so beautiful. And that embarrassment immediately turned to just like, oh, yay, let's all just eat junk food now. And then at the end of the party and the feast, we have the throwing party. And my mother and I went to the second story floor of our home. The ladies went outside. And the first thing you throw is a bag because you're about to catch a bunch of stuff. And so we threw a bag. And then afterwards, you're throwing things that a woman, I guess, would use in their home, whether or not it's home goods or I don't know what would you say I don't remember I just remember the candy kitchenware um towels maybe a blanket 
like things of that nature. And at the very end of the throwing party, they throw candy. And that's the only time when the men, little boys, are allowed to come and participate as well. And everything you catch is a prize. And my first Mardi Gras reminded me of an Oikuk just in a completely different avenue and way. So I enjoy Mardi Gras for that respect and angle, uh, but Mardi Gras is definitely a beast <laughs> that I'm still getting used to. Beyond that, the beautiful ties between Alaska and indigenous Alaska, and then the culture here, indigenous culture, black culture, but there are ties up in Alaska as well. And beyond the work that I do with Dip and Spoon, it is definitely my goal to create a really beautiful cross-cultural connection between Alaska and the state of Louisiana, specifically to New Orleans as well. Because this is my home and where I choose to live. My parents traveled here yesterday. They landed yesterday. They snowboard in Hawaii. And then in the summertime, they go back to Alaska. So it's not a bad retired life, I'd say. <laughs> and about a month and a half ago, I reached out to Zella. We had been talking about a food demo and sharing my culture with y'all for quite some time. And when I shared that my parents were visiting, I felt that this would be a proper time to actually truly share my culture, not just me, but the source. And that is my mother. So today we prepared a menu of um, moose, braised moose stew. All of the ingredients from the braised moose stew are all ingredients. If you were to be in the village, all of those ingredients are there. When you're in the village, you either have your large, like we call, we call it the AC store, which is basically a mini, mini, mini Costco. And then you have your general store, which is probably your corner store here in New Orleans. <laughs> and ingredients are hard to come by, especially fresh ingredients. So the moose stew was made with, if I were traveling in Alaska, what do my students or what does the village have access to to create different flavors of that salt, of that acid, of that heat? And so that is the reflection of the moose stew. And then my mother made the caribou soup. Um, she can dive more into the ingredients on that. My mother also made fry bread. She actually um, flew here to New Orleans with three bags of it because we didn't have time to make it here. So she flew here with it from Hawaii. Um, so you have fry bread. My Auntie Nelly, before I left Alaska, she created this blueberry banana jam for y'all. Um, canning is very popular in Alaska, especially in rural villages. And it makes sense in terms of harvesting, um, especially back in the day. Our summers are so short. We have a three month summer and then nine months out of the year it's winter. So you have a short summer to do your subsistence fishing or harvesting or what have you and prepare your home and your family. And so back in the day, that's what our ancestors would do is they would harvest all summer um, through all those avenues, salt, fat, acid, and heat. And whether or not it was moose, caribou, or salmon, a guda, it was meant to sustain you year round. Survival in Alaska is very real. We have a saying, there's no such thing as bad weather, it's how you're dressed. If you're not dressed for the weather in Alaska, you will probably die. Mm -hmm. We have extreme weather patterns, um, as you all probably know. But today, beyond the extreme weather pattern, what we have here is what, I, what some would consider extreme foods. But to my culture, they're not. Today, my mother will be creating a gouda which is our version of, we call it Eskimo ice cream. It's slightly different than the Western style, milk, cream, what have you. Um, my mom will get into a little bit of the history of a guduk. This is a dessert that I grew up eating from inside my mother's womb. <laughs> and we also have dried fish that was harvested this summer, Eskimo candy, if you will, and then seal oil, which is what you would dip it in as well. So it is my honor and pleasure to share my culture and my family, my mother Martha, my cousin Shanna with you. Thank you for stewarding me towards my North Star.
I guess when you're married to a person who talks, your children will do the same. <laughs> so, and I am grateful for that. <laughs> the table moves out. The moose do, the moose do, moose, certain time of the year, they harvest in Alaska. So they harvested in the fall time and maybe in the springtime. Caribou is slowly diminishing. The village that I'm from, Tuntutuliak, Tuntu means caribou. My mother said that there used to be lots of Tuntu in our village, and she even had a pet with her younger sister, Shana's uh, grandmother. They had that as a family pet. Any animal that is made a pet, you do not eat, even though it's consumable. When it passes, you bury it, because that's part of your family. Today, I am going to make so-called Eskimo ice cream. Many moons ago, they used to use uh, caribou fat instead of shortening. Caribou fat, as soon as they harvest the caribou, they got the fat and they hung it in the porches because in the village, they have homes about the size of this room, if not smaller. And then they had a porch in the front where they kept their food cool. So they would hang the caribou fat out in the porch and they would take it before they made the aguda. Eskimo ice cream is aguda, aguda. First of all, that I wanted to do was, um, I gotta bar this. What this saying is, Gilgamchi means I invite you. I am inviting you. Damachpchi means every one of you. Galukamun to the feast. So it says you, you are all invited to the feast. So when we have a feast in the village, the whole village is invited. And they make milk stew, bird stew, Eskimo ice cream, the salmon berries, um, beach greens or sour, dark, and they also make homemade bread, not just the sauna, which is fried bread. Um, so the, the, the shortening after the caribou fat, they started using lard. I finally found out what lard was made out of. <laughs> and it was like, okay, that's all right. If we can do something with the caribou fat, they surely can do something with a pig fat, right? And that's what they use. And then from there, they started using shortening. Many folks say that when we start explaining what ingredients we're using, they may say, ooh, how could you do that? Why do you go out to the store and buy ice cream then? That has more sugar than anything that this Aguda has. This Aguda has berries that are grown from the land. God created these berries. Nobody planted them. You just go out and pick them in the summertime in July, and then the blackberries may be in August. Cranberries are in September. So these are for the winter use. When I was growing up as a child, salmon berries that we picked, these be there's nine of us in my family. The whole family went out and picked berries. The whole family went to the fish camp because everybody is involved in preparing for the winter. Mom and my older sisters and my auntie, they all cut fish. We hung them because the fish that we um, harvest, subsistent, we cut it up, dry it outside, and take it to the smokehouse and smoke it. And then we put it in, now we put them in freezers. Before, they used to have these 55-gallon um, um, drums, 
and my dad would take the top off and he would pack them. I think in our family we had four because we'd come from a big family. So depending on how, how large your family is determines how, how many of those there were. So to start the aguduk, I also had um, ice. Yeah. This the aguda is passed down from generation to generation. Like I said, my mother made this with, with um I did wash my hands, so don't worry, okay? <laughs> so The shortening, depending on how, how much uh, berries you have, you can actually use store-bought berries if so. Now, uh, I don't have blueberries, so I didn't go. I just got here, as you were all told yesterday. Um, so these are brought all the way from Alaska via Hawaii. <laughs> so... According to what we have here, this is just about right size. It's not going to be this small. It's going to rise as the bread dough rises. Okay? So. You want me to roll your sleeve? When we make our Eskimo ice cream, we're not standing. We're either sitting down on the floor with all our ingredients around us and, and we were working on it. Or you sit in the chair with another chair in front of you and you're doing the same thing. Here, by demonstrating, I was thinking about this. A lot of people, they demonstrate standing up. A lot of cultures don't do that. So we have to be respectful of, respectful of where we are and what culture is involved. Because when you're demonstrating a culture and you're eating some of the cuisine that they have, it is something that has been here for God knows when. The land that you are standing on, New Orleans, was not New Orleans 100 or, or more than 100 years ago. It belonged to American natives that were living in this area. And what we found out was Cherokee or Choctaw, one of the two. They lived in this area, and I'm sure there was a lot of food that they harvested from the land. And so as time passes, we all come together and say, thank you for sharing your land. The reason why I add ice is because in, in, at home, they used to use snow. We would go outside in the winter time and go get some clean snow to use to cool off what we're um, stirring. And it, yes, it melts in there, but it's okay. Okay, sugar. Many of you know that as you're making something, you measure, you use, you know, follow directions. A lot of, a lot of cultures don't do that. We don't either. We just look at, okay, I can make X amount of um, a good or I can make X amount of whatever. And accordingly, we, we use every, whatever ingredients we need. So as you're stirring this, you put um, the ice to make it cold and a little bit of evaporated milk. 
why my my thing is if you can buy ice cream i can put evaporated milk in my aguda which is normally not included the whole family knows how to make aguda even men knows how to make aguda so one summer i went to visit my hometown and my older sister susie was not there because she had breast cancer and stayed in Anchorage that summer. And so when, when we got there, my, um, my older brother, Philip said, oh, we don't have any Aguda, I'll make some. I looked at him and I didn't say anything. I've never seen this man make Aguda before. <laughs> he got up, got everything ready and he made blackberry aguda of course he used a glove because i don't know maybe he thought that we would be especially david would be out of place but david has already been inundated into our culture okay i need more sugar mm. So whenever somebody has, um, we call this our dessert, our um, dessert. It is always a pleasure to know families that have Eskimo ice cream, especially the ones that have salmon berries. And so people in the villages are very inviting for other folk to come and eat at their house. So if so-and-so is invited, they may be there for lunch. Other folk may be invited during um, dinner. And the cuisine, lunchtime is totally different than dinner time. So depending on the time of, of the year and the season determines what you get to eat during that time. So salmon berries grow in the summertime and are picked during the summertime. In the fall, like I said, they hunt moose and they get the fall birds, the goose, the swan, the um, ducks, different kinds of ducks. And they also do that in the springtime. When the winter comes, it's starting to come, they have these little fish that live in creeks and they have no scales. They're about this long. Oh God, they are so good drenched in seal oil. So they have that from September till about maybe December. And then the white salmon, white fish that are lake fish, those are harvested in, in the fall time. And some may be harvested in the springtime, but most of the time it's the fall time. Um, ptarmigan is an Alaska state bird, right? Well, we harvest Alaska state bird in the winter time because they are good meat too. <laughs> and then the springtime, when, when all the wild birds like geese, duck, swan, um, migrate to Alaska, they also do springtime hunting but they don't do it all through the spring because they know they have to have their eggs and you know do their thing. And so we don't even eat those during the summertime except for the ones that are already in the freezer. And then they harvest again in the fall time. So depending on what year it is, determines what foods you have. And I'm sure that is the way the indigenous people in this area are and were and your forefathers brought their their cuisine to americas i know um when i first thought of new orleans all i thought of was mardi gras that's all they do there, that's all they do, and that's all they do is party, party, party. <laughs> no, they have lives to live. You gotta pay bills. So even though you're enjoying yourself, 
with what's going on, you still have time to relax. In the state of Alaska, we have so-called Eskimo Olympics, the Alaska Native Olympics. Each, each, um, each district have their way of doing this and, and playing that and playing this. Um, the older boys, Philip, won the high kick. So um, there's so many different areas within the state. Some look so tough because they are, all have one that you pull from ear to ear. I've never done it and I will never do it because I'm afraid my poor little ear will be ripped off. But they, that's part of the, um, the games that they have, some of, some of the games they have. And so Alaska, then after you, you, you're done with this, then you put in the, um, the berries. With what they harvest, the fur they harvest is used for coats, boots, gloves, hat. Hat is called uh, Malachi. So anytime I, anytime anybody's reading from the book of Malachi in the Bible, that's what reminds me of what we use the, the hat, the ma Malachi. Malachi, Malachi. <laughs> Similar, but one is for for your soul and, and and mind the other one is to keep you warm and then parka they they either make it out of seal skin um they bring in raccoon skin otter mink muskrat um squirrel and then for ruffs they use um, wolf, um, wolverine. They also they also they also use um, cowhide. So they they don't harvest that in up there. So they just order the cowhide. <laughs> And they, um, what Charity is wearing and what I'm wearing is the traditional um, kaspak. Women wear these. The traditional kaspak are the ones that are long, like I'm wearing. Shana is wearing a short one that's like a blouse. A more modern one. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, that's the modern kind. My mother made the kasbuk that I'm wearing. Um, when she passed, I, I took two kasbuks that belonged to her. And so I wear them with honor because nobody else will ever make one like my mama made. And back then, now I'm going to add blackberries. Back then, they didn't care if their um, the kasbuks they made, huh? Yeah, if they were matched, it, they used whatever they they had. My mom made this one has pink tie and brown um, trim. Yeah. And that's what my mom used. But late, nowadays, they, they um, match everything. So how many of you know of a sewing machine? Have you seen a sewing machine that's, that you can use by hand? You use the hand on the side? That's what my mother had when I was growing up. And they, it had the old time black um, design on it, like, like the Chinese 
Chinese um, designs. <coughs> so my mother, had, we still have it to this day. My sister keeps that. Okay, raisins. Put some in the Yeah. Okay. Men also wear qasbaks, but they're shorter. And they're more manly color, I'd say. <laughs> most of them, most of them that I grew up, my dad used to wear white. Because in the winter time, when he went seal hunting, he would use white qasbaks. The colorful ones are, were always made for women. And my mother made all of our parkas, our boots, our mittens. Because back then when I was growing up, we had real winters. Now, <laughs> because of climate change, we no longer have real winters up there. I remember as a little girl, I was six years old, my mom had made seal skin muckluck boots, they call them, and they were this high, up to my thigh. And my cousins and I, we would go out and play, shoot, pin below zero, we were nothing. Because <laughs> we had our winter clothes, and those long muckluck boots were good for sliding down ice. And that's what we used them for, and whenever we got hungry, we went back home, took all of it off, ate, then went back outside and played. I don't understand why they have, what is it, snow days? <laughs> <laughs> I never, I, we never took time off to have snow days in the village. We walked to school. Even though there was a blizzard, we still walked to school. But in the city, Anchorage, Wasilla, and all them other places, they'll have snow day. Kids don't have snow day. They'll go outside and play. So depending on where you live determines what weather you, you, you're going to deal with. Like Charity said, if you dress for the weather, you will do just fine. Why are we in Hawaii then? Because it's, our bones will not handle cold weather anymore. <laughs> Okay, the Aguda Kistan. So, if you all want to try some, there's uh, spoons here. Here's the little cup. In our area, um, the, side, the map that you see in that little it, that demonstration, we don't get whale. Whale are up in the northern part of Alaska. In, they call it the North Slope. That's where they get the whale. So we barter when we want whale meat or whale blubber. So we barter, but that's not in our area. Pardon? Um, they, we have some in our area, but not all. Yeah. But the, the whale are way up there. Those great big whales that you see in yes, the absolutely. ocean and so off of Hawaii strips, and whatever. And the great whale uh, might be. But they only harvest those during well. the certain time. Yeah. Oh, yes. Hmm? One of the animals that was, uh, that they did not mention. Yes, it's shop. in there. Yeah, there's more. Yes. There. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Are, huh? Have you had some? No. Oh, there's, um, I'm going to set one aside for you that has rice. So yeah. I did put in raisins. Okay. I hit my hat. Just, I'm not using it. Yeah. Okay.
Yeah, yeah, just grab it. Yeah, absolutely. And then it's this one. So this is seal oil. So you can dip your fish in um, here there, if you'd like. Right here. It's seal oil is a it's a delicacy. I saw it on TikTok. Oh, did you? Oh, okay. Yes, it's it's quite pungent. I saw a video of them preserving it. Oh yeah. Do you follow um is it Sheena Nova or that one gal? Is she like really famous? She, she's from Canada. Yeah, she has the markings. Yeah, the uh -huh. tradition. Yeah, yeah. she's great. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're very welcome. So this is fish strips. I would try, excuse me, I would try this on its own and then try it with the seal oil as well. <clears throat> excuse me. Depending on how the drying technique, sometimes they're salty or they're sweet. Because some people use salt, some will use sugar. And then the seal oil. I'm going back. It's really cold. It's cold. It's cold. It's cold. <laughs> It's very, it's very interesting. Well, actually, last week, you can, what's nice about this is dry food. Oh, yeah, you can get I am hungry. And you fry bread and then the jam. Yeah. Definitely. Some more caribou, some more, so, some more, uh, oh, and some caribou. Oh, yeah, so, mm -hmm, yeah. Yep. You can try it alone, and then I would. Oh, no, I, I was trying to alone. I got it. Oh, okay. Oh, I forgot about the tea. We have tundra tea. We call it tundra tea. And it's here. In this pot here. And if you want to try it, it really does it really does mm -hmm. and it really builds up a little bit goes a long way so the narrative i, I got it Multiple questions around that, around the youth. Yeah, thank you for bringing I, I read a little bit about that, but I didn't know the extent of it. So, um, the narrative that you have, is there something that you like? You do that you know, wherever you speak. Father. Um, so, it was a beautiful narrative. Thank you so much for sharing. I love it. My goal with that is um, I've been pitching op eds actually. Um, you know, I would like to. I feel my role as a leader hey, in the organization is centered more towards um, activism. Yes, and so yes. I feel this is the segue into that um, for sure. And especially, I really, really, really believe in equity, and I want Indigenous people to have equity in all those avenues. And um, I see a real. Like, in terms of equity, there's only one venture capital company in the world that's indigenous owned, and it's Canadian. And so I would like to enter an equity space for, an indivi for um, indigenous owned. David. Owners. And so when I look at it in that lens, like, okay, well, where's the representation through food and all these avenues? And then as I did the research Pardon? and then I discovered that so company oh, you're very did welcome. more in this, this, yeah. and that, I was like, okay, well, everything is rooted in equity. But I, but I can't very much like dipping spoon because everything is centered. If we're going to change public it, it, and private laws, it keeps it together. Public policy, it keeps it state together. of Alaska, you and can't find our food at a grocery store a lot of, or a lot of, at a um, restaurant. It's banned. Up there, you add fish to well, it. we know why it's banned. It's fish, BS, like it's white fish, and all this. And um, so, to so be able to it would be the, the white nutrition value in our meat food, fish that those they studies have already been done. After it's cooked, oh, yeah. they put it in so, there because. 
I really would like to create equity in those avenues. And I've reached out to a lot Mm -hmm. of different um, CEOs and or native corporations to let them know about this. Um, Because I believe it's a bigger movement for sure. Um, But it's just now I've been sharing it. Um, I was scared to share it with people because I didn't know if people would care. But then I was like, well, I care. So I'm going to share it. That's step number one, right? David. You have to care. You care. care. Yeah. But other people are going to feel that. And I'll tell you, David, you already here. Well, not here. So let's go very right. well. What I want to say you. is that slow Pardon? Oh, well that's what that's for? It's very all about oh. oh, right here. The uh, salmon bears have uh, seeds in them. There are people in my network that can connect you to connect your story to powerful media. Right? If you're ready to do that, so um, I guess my first step is if you, you know, if you trust me, like to share that with me. You want a sample? Then I can find. I can talk with some people in my network who have direct connections. So the seminary focus or is just a natural. Pardon? Is it the seminary focus? Absolutely. No. And the, and the thing in oh, Seattle, mm-hmm. Seattle, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. So, like the hippo oil. Yeah, 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 just we, there, we have the thing in the media of this kind of like this story. The tundra, oil. the tundra salmons uh, are they taste better than the ones that grow in the mountainous area. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because yeah, the, because the other way that you can have oh no no no, 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 sure. no I'm ready no, you know, the well they they ready. call them they call them cloud bears we call them salmon bears because they have the they have the color of the salmon because you can actually have, yeah. have that with add a little bit of sugar and a little bit of evaporated milk and just okay. it and wow. have it go ahead <laughs> this is really important. And so I'm telling you again, okay, if I've got a community effort, it's really community That's no problem. that is EIJ. Good, mm-hmm. Good thing there. That's a slow thing to die. And so all of that is about equity Thank you, sir. You're and justice. She is my cousin's daughter. She lives in, in Mississippi, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Where we're He's going. been fighting um, pebble mine for a long time. Okay. I went to the, the cell. I, mm-hmm. I've been writing about it for nine years on the East Coast, trying to get people on the East Coast. Do this. What happens there? That's my evaluation. Hundred percent. I can screw up. And, you, know, you know, like to eat local food. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we deal with the main. Like the mine, the headwaters of that. Mm-hmm. This very small Atlantic yeah. salmon. It's supposed to be one of the Yes, absolutely. And I would beg you to please email me. <laughs> oh, I will. Because this is something that's you know, it's amazing how there's so many different Love restaurants this. This that thing, I mean, have food from the other countries, <laughs> but, but, have, but they can Alaska native food. Don't have one. Can't have one. They claim. The only thing that they found our food. Up there. You will never find indigenous Alaska native foods, especially wild meats, at a grocery store or at a restaurant. It's banned. It hasn't been studied by the USDA or FDA for having any form of nutritious value, which is BS. We know that native food is healthy food. Mm -hmm. And I teamed up with Bering Strait School District, and they actually have an indigenized traditional curriculum that never saw the light of day. And so utilizing Edible Schoolyard's curriculum and Food Education Fund in New York, I know that indigenized culinary arts curriculum for youth can absolutely be created because of what is already out there. And so I'm going to go grab it just so you guys can see it. But my contact back in Alaska found the nutritional value in all of our indigenous Alaska native foods. This right here is completely game changing. I created a little harvest map and hunting guide 
knowing that one day I wanted to team up with higher education and study and find the nutritious value in our food so that we could create a hardcover book that doesn't say Huffin Mifflin. It has a Yupik name attached to it that our students can utilize and pass down. And to have this already, whale, beluga, land animals, <laughs> sea animals, fireweed, to have this, this is gold. And so this is the adding to my North Star in creating that indigenized culinary arts curriculum, not only for the state of Alaska, but for um, now here in Alaska, we call this the lower 48. So mm -hmm. the lower 48. And so I definitely encourage you all to take a look at it because it really is beautiful and so fascinating. And you really get to see um, a written history of our food and our culture. And then also um, this has been created with the Alaska state guidelines. So this is something that any school in this any school in the state of Alaska can actually utilize, but it has never been implemented. And so it is now part of my North Star to create. Um, and so it goes right along with our knives. And so I'm very excited to be able to be a part of bringing an indigenized culinary arts curriculum for youth and then representation in the global knife industry. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yes, you're welcome to take a look. Just take a bow. Oh, yes, of course. Where's the other bread? Mom, the other bread? The other bread. Or is that ours? Or is that Shannon's? Shannon's. Oh, I'm just going to cut like four. Okay. <laughs> Pardon? You can. The, the, I think there's some in that little. Yeah. Actually, sea oil is good to dip in um, dried lush fish. Or uh, no, not lush, um, yeah, pike, pike fish, pike fish, frozen white fish, frozen pike fish. This is what we eat, and you drizzle it on tarmican stew, stew ah, rabbit oh, stew, on top of the like I said, the little black fish we call them black fish. <laughs> drizzle with sea oil. So sea oil is we use it Wonderful. almost for everything. Great. So call us for the board. I will it's definitely just, just email them. Right. I'm going to email you. Absolutely. And then we're going to go ahead and start the contest. Okay. No, they're, they're very. Is, is, you know, this is to me, they're like butterfish. Yeah. I think butterfish like, has no scales and they're very soft. And so the blackfish are that big and they get them from, they say that they get them from little creeks or sloughs. Um, we just boil them. We boil them, and you cannot overboil them because there's a method that you have to cook them, or else if you overboil them, they get hard. Yeah, and then they also eat them frozen, dipped in sea oil. Yeah, and that that fish is only harvested in the yes, Nepal, absolutely. I would love that. Or right, like um, October till December, January. Yes, I'm happy to. Yeah, actually, um, I just got back from Alaska, and this was um, I'll give you a copy, but I, this was the impact plan that I shared with our educators. That's not all it is. Um, that just kind of goes over like that my impact statement, but our work, where we're headed, our why, and um, right, right. And they, the culinary arts that's camp why that I was talking about. I'd the rather have wild gives an overview on our work have more and topics of discussion. Yeah, how we, I'd like to build that with our educators. Yeah, store yeah. Store yeah. Oh yes, yeah. and then leading everyone to their north star so yeah. that we're all on the same page. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to give this.